Out of the hundreds of billions of planets in the cosmos, how many have the potential to support life? Is the Earth merely a small apartment situated in a huge cosmic city? Or does it sit alone in a desolate universe? A single shiny needle buried in an unfathomably large haystack. For centuries, humans have looked up in wonder, contemplating our place amongst the stars. Now, we might be closer than ever to finding the truth. Good evening. I am your host, Adrian Maddox. Together, we will journey across the cosmos and search for some of the answers to humanity's most important questions. So grab a drink and welcome to the bar at the edge of the universe. Good evening and welcome back to the show. Uh, this episode may confuse some of my viewers. Um, so this is titled The Great Silence. And some of you may remember that the very first episode that I ever produced was titled The Great Silence. And yeah, I uh, I decided to, um, to remake it. And the reason I decided to do that was I didn't really like the scripted style of the first episode it was becoming way too difficult to put in the information in a way that seemed natural and i wanted my episodes to be you know at least 30 minutes if i could do longer than 30 minutes great but the amount of writing that i had to do to create the script like i it was insane like i would have had to make an entire novel and if i was going to make more than one episode it was going to it was just not sustainable. There's no way I would have been able to keep up with it. So I decided to do the same topic, but just more of kind of like a free flow, you know, with some outlines here and there, um, just so I can keep my train of thought so I don't go off on a tangent. And, uh, you know, this conversational style might, uh, you know, it might be more personal. Uh, it might be more authentic and hopefully people might like it more. And I am actually really interested to hear if, you prefer this style over the scripted style. I have a feeling that you guys are going to like this style way more. Uh, from the people that I've showed so far, they do like this, even though I do kind of talk, you know, I get off topic here and there. But, you know, the, the, the end of the day, we're here to have fun. And, you know, this is just a form of entertainment. So, yeah, it, uh, it, it doesn't really have to be perfect. And I, I kind of figured that if I was spending so much time trying to craft these episodes meticulously and trying to make them perfect, I wasn't ever going to release anything. So I really just needed to get down in front of the mic and just talk about what I wanted to talk about. I, you know, I wanted to share the passion that I have about uh, these subjects. And yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys uh, agree with uh, my decision. And yeah, like I said, just let me know. It hit me up on any of my uh, social media later on. Uh, in the description, I'll have all the links, and I'm sure I'll say it again towards the end just to remind you. But yeah, I definitely want to hear everyone's opinion. So, tonight, we are going to be talking about The Great Silence. If you haven't listened to the first episode, The Great Silence is essentially the idea that as we look into the universe and we search for life beyond Earth... The only thing we find is silence. There does not appear to be any form of extraterrestrial life whatsoever. There have been no concrete forms of evidence pointing towards even a hint of the existence of alien life. And this is uh it's it's disconcerting to say the least um out of the whole universe are we alone it's one of the most important questions that i think humans have ever come up with and i think most people out there at some level have a desire to find out and discover our place in the universe that we live uh but it, it so far it does seem like we are alone and we have an entire universe to ourselves so I was born in 1993. I'm a 90s baby. And I am, so I'm 28 now. And my childhood consisted of awesome movies like E.T., Star Wars, and The Iron Giant. And what do all of these movies have in common? Well, they all are about, for the most part, uh, aliens. They have alien characters in them. 
Uh, I guess in the case of the Iron Giant, he's a robot, but he's an alien robot. He he came from a different planet to come destroy the Earth, and he gets bonked on the head, and then he's good now. And you know that, that's a great that's a great movie. I loved that movie when I was a kid. It scared the crap out of me the first time I saw it. I was kind of a wuss, but it's an amazing movie nonetheless. Still one of my all time favorite kids movies, and I watch it with my daughter to this day. Uh, I also remember as a boy reading sci-fi books like Ender's Game and War of the Worlds. Both of those depict aliens. War of the Worlds has the Martians, and Ender's Game has the Buggers. And I absolutely love Ender's Game. i totally in agreement. That is one of the best sci-fi books ever written. And I read somewhere that Orson Scott Card was surprised at the success of Ender's Game because he planned the whole thing as a series and Ender's Game was just supposed to be the introduction. And I honestly, I, I'm not sure I've actually met anybody besides myself that has read any of the other Ender's Game books. Uh, most people have read the first one, but I, I just find that interesting. <laughs> and it's kind of funny that the author is kind of like, uh, guys, there's, there's more to the story. It wasn't just this, but I mean, <laughs> I'm glad you guys like it. <laughs> so yeah, I grew up reading those things and watching those movies. And so I had a, a huge interest in space and sci-fi and uh, specifically the thought of alien life, like because it was so prevalent in all forms of media that I consumed to me, aliens were real. Like I didn't really think about it too much. I obviously that, you know, obviously there was aliens out there. The universe was, seemed so big. It just seemed natural, but I'll never forget, my mom gave me a space encyclopedia one day, and I was super excited, and I ran to my room, and I closed the door, I sat down right on the floor, opened that encyclopedia, and I flipped to the chapters, uh, the table of contents, and I saw that there was a chapter about extraterrestrial life, and I'm like, oh, awesome. So, of course, that's one of the first chapters that I furiously uh flipped to and <laughs> much to my dismay it was the shortest chapter in the book there had to have been maybe two or three pages in this whole chapter and if you look i've tr i've tried to find this encyclopedia as an adult i wish i remembered what company made it because i would just love to have it to look through it again but i remembered this chapter had pictures of different aliens from uh, entertainment. So <laughs> I think there was a picture of a Klingon from Star Trek. I think there was, uh, there might've been like an alien from Star Wars. And there definitely was, uh, oh, what's, uh, oh, what's that movie called? The Day the Earth Stood Still, like the giant robot. There was definitely a picture of him in there. I remember that. And the section was talking about how humans you know like to create aliens that are humanoid and kind of represent ourselves in a way because that's like all we know uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that if you know if life exists out there it could look completely different i'm like okay cool yeah like i like these movies these are great um but i, I want more information where's the data i want to know what people are learning about you know i don't really care about reading about the movies this is a space encyclopedia where's the information at and so i kept reading and it talked about how uh, there there was a time when scientists thought that it was likely that life existed on Mars. And unfortunately, it turned out that that was not the case. And so far, we have not found any, um, any hint of life on Mars. And so I'm like, okay, that's cool. So what... Uh, do you have, does this book have any cool information for me? Anything exciting? And the idea of the chapter, I think the main point that I got from it was that, no, there, there is no exciting information really about the subject it, as far as like actually finding anything. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's anything to find. Everything points towards us being alone in the entire universe and that to me was was crazy 
and it was a uh, I obviously I've continued to think about it over the years and you know I'm not I'm not quite happy with that answer and my uh my confusion about this was only uh was only furthered when later on uh I had to have been about 14 or so we my family took a road trip to uh, it was a cross-country road trip, and I think we might have been going to Washington, D.C. from Washington State, or we might have been going to Florida. I'm not sure. We made a lot of road trips, so they kind of bleed together. But specifically, I remember that we made a pit stop in Roswell, New Mexico. Now, for those of you who don't know, Roswell, New Mexico is famous. Uh, and it's famous from... Uh, it has it had an historic event in 1949. Now, this town is the UFO capital of the world, and it all stems from this event. Uh, so, what happened was essentially in 1949, the army made an official press release stating that they had recovered a flying saucer in Roswell, New Mexico, and as you can imagine, this made newspaper headlines. You can find the actual newspaper clipping uh, on Wikipedia, uh, and people were going nuts. There, because imagine today if the Air Force was like, "Hey guys, uh, we uncovered a flying saucer in you know whatever city, and yeah, we have that now. It's a thing." And pe people would be losing their minds. They'd be like, "Holy crap! This is insane! What? Like, I know I would." Um, that happened in 1949 like that that really happened uh but unfortunately the army uh because air force wasn't a thing at the time but the army immediately retracted that statement and they actually corrected themselves and said that uh yeah that flying saucer that we found no that's actually a weather balloon and there is a uh, completely normal nothing to see here <laughs> and that's where that whole saying about oh it's just a weather balloon and it all stems from this uh and as you can imagine <laughs> uh a lot of people don't necessarily trust the government and it really sparked the uh the huge conspiracy of you know government cover-ups and aliens and the president knowing and the whole like ufo um like culture really got started after this incident in Roswell, New Mexico. And during my road trip, we visited Roswell, New Mexico. We made a pit stop, like I said. And let me tell you, this city is crazy. And I don't think it's changed too much in recent years. That If you go there, you'll see that this entire town is dedicated toward that event in 1949. The entire town, I guess it's a city technically, the entire city is alien themed and it's ufo themed right so you have alien themed restaurants you have alien themed shops you have alien themed statues there's the international ufo museum and research center uh i remember that there was one building where it looked like a flying saucer had crashed into the building and half of the half of the ship was like sticking out of the side uh i don't know if it was a store or if it was a restaurant or what I mean, it might have been the museum. I'm not sure. But, like, what? And it's... There's so many of, of these things there. And the people go there as tourists to see this. It's the UFO capital of the world. And that, to me, is... It, it's just so weird that, like, a place... It's incredible that a place like that exists. Like, how awesome is that to check out? I actually really kind of want to go back and see it as an adult. Now that I'm able to, you know, kind of grasp things a little bit better and and maybe you know see things we didn't actually go to the museum when i went there as a kid i think we just stopped to get something to eat and i just happened to see things on our way through uh, but maybe spending some time there as an adult and like checking things out that that could potentially be like super interesting um something something else that's crazy the city's official seal it's a picture uh of roswell new mexico like kind of towards the bottom of the seal and then there's the night sky above it and then above the night sky, there's actually like a green alien with the huge head and like big eyes. And he's looking down 
over the city at night. And like they have they full send with the alien theme. And it's a big part of their culture there and they are super proud of it. And you know, it has to make them a lot of money. I'm sure it keeps the uh, economy afloat for them. Uh brings in people. But you know, it kind of it kind of gets me wondering like how could how could something influence a culture so much if there wasn't even a shred of truth to this and it really you know it really confused me even more when i thought about that we should be alone and this whole roswell thing it shouldn't have ha like it was it was it should be a weather balloon because there are no there seem to be no aliens so but you know things just were not adding up especially you know in my mind back then and it that since there's no answer, you know, I've just continued to think about it over the years. Uh, if I asked you what image comes to mind when you think of aliens, so close your eyes and I want you to imagine an alien or just whatever the first image is, right? More than likely, you're thinking of, you know, a skinny, scrawny, green alien with a huge head, or maybe they're gray. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they might be gray with, you know, huge head, black eyes. That's the standard stereotypical alien. Uh, you might also think about, you know, something a little friendlier, like, uh, like E.T. from the movie. Or you might be thinking about ships that appear all over the world and destroy our national monuments and try and kill all humans. Uh, <laughs> but I am willing to bet that... You are not thinking of men living on the moon that ride three-headed vultures while waging war against a kingdom living in the sun. If you were thinking of that, well, you're probably listening to this for a second time <laughs> because you love the sound of my voice, right? <laughs> it's either that or you are very familiar with your Greek literature, your ancient Greek literature. So 2,000 years ago, there was this uh, author named Lucian of Samosata, and he is credited with creating the earliest known work of science fiction. Now, this story was titled Vera Historia, and Vera Historia translates to a true story. This title is a, a tongue-in-cheek reference to the ridiculousness of this story, and the story is written as a satire. It's supposed to be funny. Uh, but... What makes it interesting is that it is considered the first work of science fiction. It has many tropes that carry on today. And I guess they, a lot of these ideas in our modern science fiction all stem from you know, the ideas that were presented here originally 2,000 years ago. Like, just think about how long ago that was, 2,000 years ago. Now, in the story, Vera Historia... There is space travel, there are extraterrestrials, and there's even interplanetary war. Like, <laughs> that all describes like something we would see in Star Trek, Star Wars, uh, it, you know, any modern you know, sci-fi story. Uh, so the story goes, uh, Lucian, yeah, the story is about himself, which is kind of funny. He has a crew of his uh, uh his companions they, they are on a uh, sailboat large uh large ship and they are journeying throughout the world going on adventures and one one day there's a giant storm in the ocean and they get they get caught in the storm of course and the storm is so powerful that it pulls their ship from the water and the wind catches the sails and it blows them into outer space let me read you a little bit from this about noon when the island was no longer in sight a whirlwind suddenly arose spun the boat about raised her into the air about 300 furlongs and did not let her down into the sea again but while she was hung up a lot a wind struck her sails and drove her ahead with belly and canvas. For seven days and seven nights we sailed the air, and on the eighth day 
we saw a great country in it, resembling an island, bright and round, and shining with a great light. So this storm took Lucian and his companions into space, and they shipwreck on the moon. What? <laughs> uh, so their their ship shipwrecks on the moon, and they're you know they're like, oh, okay, what do we do? They get out of their ship and they start exploring. And this is where uh, <laughs> what I was talking about earlier happens. While they're exploring, they, they get captured by three men riding three-headed vultures. And when asked who they are, they tell them that we're from Greece. And uh, yeah, we got caught in a storm and we wound up here. We don't mean you any harm. And the men on the vultures are like, okay, cool. Uh, we are just scouts, but yeah, we got to capture you. Or we got to take you in to see our king. And Lucian and his companions are like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing now. <laughs> what option do you have when you're confronted with the man riding a giant three-headed vulture? Like, you got to do what he says, right? So they go and see the king. And this moon king is actually a pretty reasonable guy. He says that he, you know, he's not going to harm them. Uh, but, and he does tell them the story of how he came to be uh, in a war versus the kingdom that lives in the sun. Uh, let me read this part to you here. You'll find this interesting. Once upon a time, I gathered the poorest people in my kingdom and undertook to plant a colony on the morning star, which was empty and uninhabited. Phatheon, out of jealousy, thwarted the colonization, meeting us halfway at the head of his ant dragoons. At that time, we were beaten, for we were no match for them in strength, and we retreated. Now, however, I desire to make war again and plant that colony. If you wish, then you may take part with me in the expedition, and I will give each of you one of my royal vultures and a complete outfit. We shall take the field tomorrow. So the king just offered for them to join his cause against this kingdom on the sun and they're going to get their own vultures to help fight so of course <laughs> they're you know free a free three-headed vulture dude you count me in i'll fight whatever battle you want like that's sick <laughs> uh yeah they do in fact help them in this war and they fight in this huge battle and on both sides, there are creatures that are like, like genetically modified mutant hybrid animal things, which is cool. Like we see that a lot in modern sci-fi, right? And in a shocking twist, the Sun Kingdom wins. I don't think anyone saw that coming. And the way that they achieve their victory is so crazy. The Sun Kingdom gets the idea to create a cloud, a, like a cloud of gas. And they use this giant cloud to completely surround the moon. And it shrouds them in complete darkness. The moon kingdom has no option. They have to surrender. <laughs> Their entire kingdom is covered in pitch black. There's no light, right? <laughs> you have to give up at that point like what what a cool idea to surround an entire to just take the light away and they can't do anything that to me i could totally see that being it's probably already been done and i'm just not aware of it like i could totally see that being in a in a sci-fi in a sci-fi movie or like a book or something but how cool is it two thousand years the story is two thousand years old that long ago they were coming up with ideas like this. And from then onwards, people have only gained more interest in this type of things. Just look at how important these sci-fi ideas have been to us through the media and entertainment that we've consumed over the years. And for a lot of people, ideas like these have inspired them to you know, do research in that area. 
Today, astronomers estimate there to be 100 to 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. That's just the observable universe, okay? We don't actually know how big the universe truly is. There is a limit to how far we are able to see, and it has to do with the, the amount of time that light takes to travel. We can only see so far away. So I want you to think of the observable universe as a bubble around the Earth, and we can't see what's beyond that bubble. It's a little more complicated than that, but for now, that will do. Okay, so just within this bubble, 100 to 200 billion galaxies. Okay. Now, in our galaxy alone, the Milky Way, there are estimated to be 100 to 400 billion stars. That's a lot. <laughs> that is quite a bit. But 100 to 400 billion, like, that's quite a... Uh, that's a bit of a difference. The 400 billion is four times more than 100 billion. Like, but the thing is, there are so many stars that we cannot account for all of them. So, yeah, the best we can do is you know, kind of make estimates. And 100 to 400 billion. Basically, all you need to know is that there are a hell of a lot of stars out there. And the interesting part is that each of those stars could potentially at least have one planet orbiting them. So... They estimate that there are at least as many planets as there are stars, so 100 to 400 billion planets. But that's only if, like, okay, so each star might have at least one planet. Some stars might not have any, but what if the majority of stars have, like, more than one? The amount of planets out there, astronomical. Truly just astronomical, and the, the potential for so many different types of worlds and the potential for the conditions on our world to be repeated like so many times is huge. And when I was a kid, I may not have known, I may not have known these stats. I may not have understood these numbers or heard anything about this, like this in depth. But I did live in rural Alaska. Much of my childhood was spent there, like out in the bush. And I remember looking at the Arctic night sky and being amazed at how many stars there were. it The whole sky was like lit up. For people that live in a city with a lot of light pollution and you don't get to see any stars and you, you've never seen anything like that, there, I can't even really describe the feeling to you. You almost feel like naked because you, you feel so insignificant because we have our sun, we have our planet, but... There's all these other suns, all these other stars out there, and you're just one speck amongst all these other ones. You feel so small and like insignificant, but so special at the same time. So I knew that there were a lot of stars. I knew there were potentially a lot of worlds. The universe was enormous. Where is everyone? Now that question was actually posed long before my time in 1950 by the famous physicist Enrico Fermi. Some of you guys may have heard of the Fermi Paradox. It's named after this gentleman. In 1950 at the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. It seems like a lot of this, uh, a lot of this stuff happens, has to do with New Mexico, right? <laughs> uh, but Fermi went on a lunch break with a few of his colleagues. While they were on lunch and eating their food, his colleagues were talking about work and just kind of mingling, you know. And then out of nowhere, Fermi says, where is everyone? And his colleagues start laughing because it just seemed like, seemed like such a random question. But somehow at the same time, they all knew that he was talking about aliens. And that moment created, uh, or that moment was uh, what coined what we attribute to the creation of the term Fermi paradox. The definition of the Fermi paradox is the contradiction between the statistical likelihood and the apparent lack of evidence of alien life. That's basically what we're talking about. Fermi paradox, the great silence, kind of like the same. They are exactly the same thing. 
So, the thing with the Fermi Paradox, it f seems like there should be a lot of aliens out there. It feels like there should, because there's a lot of worlds out there. But fields and seams are not measurable. Is there a way to mathematically calculate the chances of us finding aliens? Is there a way to put some numbers into this to get something tangible and testable? Well, in 1961, an astronomer named Frank Drake created a famous equation called the Drake Equation. And the Drake Equation does just that. It estimates the number of alien civilizations in the Milky Way that are producing detectable signs of their existence. So these signs can include like more than likely like radio signals or something like that. Now, I imagine that this equation is taught in a undergraduate astrobiology class um, because it is a, it, it really seems like that's a lot of what the, what that field is based on. Um, and like I said, it's, it's, it's quite a, it's quite a mouthful, but I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. And I wish that I could write it down for you so you could visualize it because each term is like a full on sentence, but, uh, for our purposes, yeah, just kind of bear with me here. Okay. So the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy, whose electromagnetic emissions are detectable is equal to the rate of formation of stars suitable for the development of intelligent life times the fraction of those stars with planetary systems times the number of planets per solar system with an environment suitable for life times the fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears times the fraction of life bearing planets on which intelligent life emerges times the fraction of civilizations that develop a technology that produces detectable signs of their existence times the average length of time such civilization produce such signs Whew. Okay, that's a lot. I don't expect you guys to memorize all of this. But I think it is that you have to touch on this. If you're talking about alien life, you have to talk about the Drake equation. Uh, the thing is, though, as famous as this equation is, I'm not convinced that it's really all that scientific. And a lot of people, and a lot of scientists, a lot of smart people would agree with me. Have been known to agree, have been known to say the same thing. These uh, these terms here, let's say the last one, two, three, four. The last four terms, those are completely unknowable. So let's go back a little bit. The fraction of suitable planets on which life actually appears. Okay, so what what number do we plug in there? We only know of one planet. Okay, so. It, you could put one in there, I guess. Uh, I mean, are you're not really supposed to count Earth because that, you know, you're not trying to calculate. You're trying to calculate aliens, right? You're not trying to calculate humans. So, okay, so we're not going to put one in there. But any other number is just a complete guess. You could put zero, or you could put a trillion. <laughs> the same thing with the next term. The fraction of life bearing planets on which intelligent life emerges. How can you know that? That's not un that that is unknowable. Any number that you put there is just going to be like what you feel like. <laughs> it's just going to be a complete guess. And Drake was a smart guy. He knew this. And he was actually surprised that his equation uh, got as famous as it did. You're not supposed to take this equation that seriously. What you're supposed to do is use this equation as a thought experiment. This equation serves as a place to start when you're thinking about finding alien life. You can't actually really solve it. Okay. What use is an equation where the answer could be anything? Right? You're not supposed to really use it like an equation. It's just supposed to give you certain things that you can start to look at when you are doing research in this area. It's supposed to get your mind turning. And, you know, that's what Drake thought. And I'm in agreement with him. And the but the you know, the equation took off. And a lot of people that I have met a few of these people that do think that it 
you know, that this is kind of like the, um, the end all be all of this is how you calculate how many aliens are out there. Like it's been solved or something. Um, but no, that's, that's not what this is at all. Moral of the story is don't take it too seriously, but it is certainly interesting and it gets the, it gets the cogs turning, right? Uh, since, since then research has continued and I want to talk about a, uh, a few of the things that uh, people have found, uh, some of the papers that have been submitted in the Astronomical Journal. In 2019, researchers published a paper in the Astronomical Journal titled The Fermi Paradox and the Aurora Effect, Exo-Civilization Settlement, Expansion, and Steady States. Now, I want to start off by saying that it is so cool that people are doing research on like the Fermi Paradox like th these people are getting paid to stud like study aliens. <laughs> like what? That's a thing. How do I get into that? That is awesome. Like I can't even really imagine. Like I don't know. That is so cool to me. Uh, like kudos to these people. It, it sounds like a lot of fun. And then you're surrounded by people that are interested in the same stuff. Like I really want to get into something like that. Um, but yeah. So this paper proposes that the Earth might exist in a settled galaxy. And when it says settled, that means uh, like there are one or more alien civilizations that have like essentially colonized uh, areas of the galaxy, right? So we're not alone. So Earth might exist in a settled galaxy, but remain undiscovered due to local abundances of inhabitable planets produced by statistical fluctuations. This can create large clusters of settled areas, as well as regions of unsettled space, the latter of which Earth may exist in. So what that's saying is that just through statistical fluctuations, there could be clusters of a bunch of inhabitable planets, like over here in this part of the galaxy. And all the aliens might be here because there's so many planets here and they have so many resources that there's no reason for them to venture out into an area that the earth might be in that there's only like a few habitable planets. There's no reason for them to do that. It would just be a waste. So we might exist in, you know, that empty area, but we might be neighbors to an area that's just filled with the, with the whole civilization filled with aliens flying around and doing stuff. Now, that's really cool. I'd never heard, um, I never heard this idea proposed and this paper, it has a ton of information in there. And I don't pretend to understand even, <laughs> even 80% of what they write. Uh, but it's cool. And I'll have links in the uh, show description so you guys can check it out. It's super cool. Uh, the, the following year, you guys may have heard of this. The following year, another paper uh, will be published reporting the discovery of phosphine gas in Venus. Now, I remember people at work talking about this. There were headlines and like Facebook posts, articles, researchers discover traces of life on Venus. And I remember seeing that and being like, what? Like, holy crap, this is, this changes everything. Like this could be, this, this is, this, this could be insane. Like what a finding. Okay. And people at work were talking about it. I was talking about it with my buddies because a lot of them are into the same stuff as me. And uh, I think uh, to this day, a lot of people uh, still kind of cling on to this. And I know I did because like, <laughs> like that's so cool. Um, but uh, I, let me uh, let me describe let me describe the paper a little more. So they discovered uh, traces of phosphine gas in Venus, and uh, well, in Venus's atmosphere using radio telescope observations. Um, now, this was a big deal because the only known natural source of phosphine is from the decay of organic matter containing phosphorus. Phosphorus is a chemical element with a symbol P and atomic number 15. And within Venus's, Venus's atmosphere, only um, within Venus's atmosphere, any phosphorus should be an oxidized form. So there's no natural causes for phosphine. But yet we're detecting phosphine, or I should say there's no natural causes without organic matter that would produce phosphine, but we're detecting it. So does that mean there's organic matter on Venus? Like, 
what gives that's that's crazy like that there there has to be like organic matter there unless there's some process that we don't know about yet that is creating it in another way right uh, so yeah, they, you know, they discovered a, what could be a possible hint towards life existing there. And, you know, that was really big news. It was super exciting, but there was a, uh, there, there was follow-up research, of course, and follow-up research challenged these findings. Uh, there was a paper titled complications in the Alma detection of phosphine on Venus. And it was published in January of 2021. And, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, the paper says that the measurement of that amount of phosphine was likely due to an error. Uh, any subsequent measurements that they've made have been unsuccessful to find uh, that level of phosphine or any phosphine in the atmosphere. Um, so more than likely, it, it, it was just due to some sort of uh, maybe a malfunction or some some sort of error, right? Uh, let, they do not completely dismiss the possibility. Uh, they do state, quote, additional millimeter, submillimeter, and infrared wavelengths with ground or space-based observations are necessary for further investigation. Um, but yeah, like at the, at, at the end of the day, they, they are saying that more than likely this was due to an error, especially since we can't replicate this. We're not, we're not really sure what happened, but, uh, you you take out like the least uh yeah so sometimes you kind of go with the the most uh the most likely thing especially when you can't repeat your uh your crazy result that you got the first time and you know that that is disappointing because yeah, yeah i really thought we were onto something there um and it seems like he, he can't help but feel that it, you start to make progress and uh you're back to square one, kind of like, oh no, you didn't actually find anything. It's like, okay, so now we got to start over and keep looking for stuff. Uh, but you know, that's, that's what science is about. It's not about trying to prove what you want to believe. It's about proving what is true, whether you believe it or not. Right? So, I would say that people, so people that work on this type of thing, they're not going dis to get discouraged. They're going to keep doing research. They all have a passion for this stuff. And they're, you know, they're professional by, you know, checking each other's findings and they're doing the right thing. And uh, you got to commend them for that. And may, you know, maybe one day we will actually find something. And I, I honestly just love the fact, like I said earlier, I can't get over that there are people that get paid to actually like do this. Like how cool is that? Uh, and if you have a chance, I definitely would look at some of the research that's being put out and read more about this type of stuff. And a lot of people don't know about these little things here and there, especially like the first paper that I brought up. Um, but the most famous example of this type of research has to be the SETI Institute. So the SETI Institute is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute, okay? And this institute employs around 100 scientists from different fields. They have astronomers, they have astrobiologists, they have astrophysicists, they have chemists, they have radio astronomers, and they all work together to try and search for extraterrestrial intelligence. So one thing to note is SETI, S-E-T-I, the acronym that is a blanket term for this type of research okay so there's SETI and then there's the SETI Institute when I was doing research and trying to learn about this I originally just looked up SETI and I was like super confused because I was trying to find the actual like organization but it wasn't coming up and it really confused me because SETI ends in an I and I kind of assumed that the I meant Institute so I like for some reason I thought it was like search for extraterrestrial institute or something like that, uh, but no, that's not the case. So you have SETI, which is the whole branch of this type of research, and then you have the SETI Institute, which is the actual organization, you know, with facilities, and they got the radio telescopes and stuff like that. So the reason that I say that this is the most well known, uh, uh, the most well the the most well known branch of SETI 
is it was made famous in the 1997 movie Contact. Contact was based on a novel by Carl Sagan. And this movie influenced me greatly over the years. It follows the story of a SETI scientist who is uh, at work one day. And she, I think it actually takes place at night, of course. And she has these uh, giant headphones on. She's listening to signals. And then all of a sudden she hears the, like a pattern play. And she recognizes that this is clearly not just uh, like your normal uh, signal that you would be hearing from, you know, whatever. This is an intelligent, like mathematical pattern based uh, signal. So she calls up her colleagues and she's like, hey, listen to this, tune into this frequency. They put on their headphones and they're like, oh my God. Oh my God. Holy crap. Like, they are going crazy. They <laughs> they should not be hearing this, right? Like everything has led to this moment. And it turns out that aliens are in fact trying to contact us. And the movie is awesome. You guys have to check it out. I'm not going to spoil anything. Um, it's a little slower. It's not a lot of action. But what I did like is that it's, it's a movie that kind of makes you think. And I like movies like that. It had more to say than just like what the story was. It kind of makes you question whether or not humans are ready to even know our place in the universe. We want to know so bad, but maybe we're not at the point where we should know. Maybe we need to be a little bit more mature and more advanced and um, not so like, <laughs> not so crazy, I guess, because you know, humans do crazy things. Uh, so it makes you think about that. And it's just a really good movie. I highly recommend you guys watching it. Um, so that, that's what introduced me to the SETI Institute originally. Um, so despite all the research that has been done, we have so far found nothing. The Great Silence. And there is nothing to really indicate that we will ever find anything. And the Great Silence is actually an answer to the Fermi paradox according to some people anyway they say that there are no signs of aliens because aliens do not exist what do you think of that I do not agree <laughs> I do not agree at all and I'll tell you why if I were to take a butterfly net Go out into my backyard right now, swing my butterfly my butterfly net around five times, and I come running back in, and I present my empty net to you, and I say, "Look, here's an empty net. Butterflies don't exist." What kind of look would you give me? You'd be like, "Man, okay, that doesn't that <laughs> no, <laughs> like that no, that's not a thing." Uh, that's not to say that butterflies don't exist, but you can't use the absence of evidence to completely discredit it, you know, but you do have to keep the possibility. So, you know, we, we had to talk about it. Um, and the idea that we are alone or that we could be alone is a scenario that I want to address in a later episode. And I think it is the most unsettling idea of all just having a whole universe to ourselves or a tiny speck. And then once our speck is gone, that's it. That to me is scary. There was a famous quote. I, I think it was said by Arthur C. Clarke. I think don't crucify me if it was by someone else. I'm sorry, but that's just the name that jumps to mind. And this person said that there are either two explanations. Maybe Carl Sagan said this. I don't know. Anyway, someone smarter than me said this. <laughs> there are either two explanations. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. I don't agree. I think the former is scarier. I can deal with 
aliens flying around out there doing their thing. Maybe they want to kill us. Maybe they don't. Who knows? But the idea of being completely alone in an ocean of nothing? That's terrifying. Now, there are many other answers that have been proposed regarding the Great Silence and the Fermi Paradox. And we are going to analyze those in future episodes as well. And these other answers uh, can be broken into two groups. Uh, one group is that aliens are already here. Uh, there has already been contact in some form. might be one-sided. Uh, the aliens do exist. But for some reason, we don't know about them. Or they have kept themselves the, a secret for some reason, right? The second group of answers are that aliens exist but we have yet to cross paths with them. They're still out there waiting to be found. And I got the idea to split my episodes in much the same way as this book that I read called Where Are the Aliens? 75 Solutions to the Fermi Paradox. I believe it was what it's called. I will have the, uh, the source in the description for anyone who wants to check it out. It's an awesome book. Uh, and uh, the author organizes his chapters in the same way. And I thought that was a great great way to organize it. it just made sense so i took inspiration and i'm gonna do it like that uh but yeah so we have future episodes to look forward to i think the next one is more than likely going to be talking about the possibility that aliens uh do exist um but they have remained a secret and i actually think that at some point i am going to do an entire episode on the drake equation because there's so many terms in the Drake equation. We can really analyze each one. Like just the first one where it talks about the rate of star formation. We can get into like how stars are formed and you know, the other rate. And there's a lot to learn just within that section alone that I think doing a full episode on the Drake equation could be, <laughs> it could be a lot of fun. So uh, hopefully you guys will be interested in that. But yeah, we're going to keep going down this rabbit hole and talk about the great silence and the Fermi paradox. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So hopefully you guys stick around. And I want to thank you guys so much for listening. And I, I really want to know, do you like this type of conversation style? Like This was completely unscripted. I probably stumbled over some words here and there, said some like stupid stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I'm probably going to listen to this 10 times back and then compare it to my scripted version. And then, you know, I'm going to be like, oh, dude, I don't know which one I like better. But if I could really get some feedback, that would mean so much for me, guys. And, you know, I just want to make this, this podcast as as good as possible as entertaining as informative and as fun as possible like this whole thing is just supposed to be a good time and yeah so you know, you guys can reach me anytime you leave a comment send me a message on instagram send me a message on discord send me a smoke signal <laughs> like i don't care send me a radio signal for bouncing off space and say that you're an alien and you heard my podcast and i'm like oh my god right uh but yeah like, thank you guys so much for listening and <laughs> i'll see you guys on the next episode I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. Remember to raise your telescopes and never stop on your quest for knowledge, except for maybe a drink. This is The Bar at the Edge of the Universe. I've been your host, Adrian Maddox. Thank you, and good night.